Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we're going to talk policy, which is not the funniest thing to talk about on the uh, second day of a conference during the last sessions. Uh, so I feel that you're very courageous to be here. Uh, today, I represent the open, the open source of the battery from the European Commission. Uh, and for this mission, we are presenting to the open source communities across Europe the Interoperable Europe Act, which is the newest proposal from the European Commission. Um, just as a small agenda, just to show a bit of what you're going to hear today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly explain what is OZER, because I think uh, you can also have an interest of knowing a bit more about this platform. And then a bit about the UPL, which we probably know uh, a bit about. And then the act itself. Um, so OZER, the platform I'm working for, is an observatory. It's an open source observatory of the European Commission on the use of open source in public administrations. There, we publish news items weekly. We have a monthly newsletter. Um, I recommend you subscribe to it as well if you're interested. And we also have what we call our Knowledge Center, which is a compilation of uh, different things. You have the reports, guidelines, uh, research papers, and case studies on the use of open source in public administrations in EU member states, but also outside of the EU. Um, and I hope it can be maybe useful to some of you if you're working with public administration yourself or if you're interested by the subject. Um, we also organize community events, um, events such as this one where I'm participating right now, or events that we organize ourselves. We are currently working on a series of workshops and webinars, and they will be implicating uh, different actors from the open source community in public administrations, and we hope to be able to write a handbook uh, from this series of events, uh, which should be uh, with the objective of disseminating knowledge to the different uh, administrations that want to use open source and to help foster that. Um, OZOR is located on the Joiner platform, and the, on the Joiner platform, which is a, a federated platform of a different uh, project of the European Commission, you can also find the Joiner licensing assistant. So this is a bit of a bonus as well, this one, but uh, it can be quite interesting also if you're developing software. There you can find and compare software licenses based on their capabilities but also based on their legal certainties. Uh, it's linked to the software package data exchange. And it's easily available. And it's also you can also find there the compatibility checker, which is whenever you want to integrate components which use different licenses to see whether there's a legal compliance. Um, this is particularly useful for public administrations when they want to make sure that their tools will be actually compliant. Um, and the question of licensing here is essential um, also for the Interoperable Europe Act. And that's why one of the first tools that the European Commission developed, the European institution developed uh, regarding the interoperability of public services in Europe was something you know about probably, which is the EUPL. And the EUPL, um, I, I will just say a few words, but uh, it's a license that allows interoperability that also uh, is the main argument around the EUPL is that it is a legal certainty for public administration because it is first respecting all the EU laws on licensing and also it is available in 23 languages. So for public administration that need to uh, sign contracts in their own languages, it also allows for that. Um, you can see a number of examples where the EUPL is currently used in public administrations around the EU and the interoperable Europe Act is also basing its approach around the UPL. So um, I'll leave a bit of time at the end for you to ask questions or to, for your reactions, because we're actually very interested in knowing what you think about these dispositions. Um, the proposal for the Interoperable Europe Act is just a proposal so far. It has not been yet voted. It is being negotiated at the moment. Therefore, it is still not fully fixed in the terms in the um, text itself. Um, and we want to see why I'm here today and why uh, OZOR is presenting the act is also to see how the open source community in Europe can be part of that act, can be part of this new process of the new framework, and how can this act also enable the open source community to exist uh, within, with public administration and within public administrations. So interoperability, I uh, feel a bit stupid explaining this to you because I think most of you know about this, but for public administration interoperability maybe has a different meaning and it is 
mainly the possibility of these seamless data exchanges. Um, the practical implications of interoperability of public services is quite important for EU member states. So far, the EU has managed to create a single market uh, with, a free, um, free, um, with no, no barrier to goods, to people, to services, and to capitals. But there's no single uh, digital market. And so one of the challenges that people find out uh, in public administration when trying to do cross-border public services is the fact that this data format, that these services are not necessarily interoperable so far. So there's class classic examples. There's some that are illustrated in the day-to-day -day life. Um, I studied in Strasbourg uh, not so long ago still, and uh, we had this used question during COVID, for example, of the question of uh, bed allocations and the fact that health systems between France and Germany that were very close and that were just separated by a border and could not communicate properly was very problematic because it could have helped potentially um, help take care of patients quicker and maybe have better effect and be more efficient simply. Um, but yeah, and these challenges are found not only in the examples here, um, you, you find these problems in all parts of public administrations and therefore there's a real interest in terms of um, cost saving but also in efficiency of public services across the EU to have this service made interoperable. So the policy on interoperability is not something new at EU level, it's been a work from the EU institutions since 1995. Uh, the main component of it is the framework, the European Interoperability Framework. Right now we are with the version of 2017, it's a new interoperability framework, um, but there were previous versions in 2004 and 2010, uh, but this is non-binding. That means that member states of the EU don't necessarily have to follow all of it, and while it's monitored uh, through the NIFO, the uh, National Interoperability Framework Observatory, it's still non-binding and therefore the Interoperable Europe Act is trying to change that. Um, there's been also support to this interoperability activity since 1995, like I was saying, and also through JoinUp, the platform on which Ozor is, um, as well as more informal uh, cooperation through the CIO network uh, since 2015. So these are all the ways that uh, the EU institutions are trying to help member states make the services more open towards each other and to achieve uh, this interoperability. But right now, there's no framework as such. So there's different initiatives and there's a lack of coordination among these different initiatives, both at EU levels and both at member states' levels. So what the Act is also trying to achieve is what could be improved there, is to have this global governance of interoperability efforts between all the different levels of public administrations in the EU. And for that, we clearly see that there's a lack of common specifications, shared solutions and standards that would allow this technically. Um, but it's also in terms of policy uh, that the interoperability by default approach is not yet fully in. It's not something that's taken into account into all policies, which is also something very important when you're trying to rule over, to, to, to create rules for 27 member states. And so the Commission, and this may be a bit barbaric to those of you who don't know so much about EU legislation or the legislative procedures, but so the Commission makes first a proposal, but for that, they first have to gather evidence and to gather uh, data to make sure that the proposal they're going to do is based on the assessment of people that are going to be affected by it. So there were uh, consultations, there was as well um, recommendation from an expert group, there were an evaluation of the past policies, as well as analysis from the Joint Research Centre, for example, which is the think tank of uh, the European Parliament, as well as data collection from the NIFO. And so all of this is just a long process to come to the stage where we can now today have a possibility of a new regulation that is based on all this data. Um, and as I was saying a bit before, uh, there's no comprehensive framework yet for interoperability. These are all regulations that are either uh, already passed and but the two last ones, which are still being negotiated um, and um, voted down by the institutions. Uh, all of these tackle certain parts of what is needed for interoperability of public services. Uh, from the single digital gateway, which has been implemented and that you can probably see in 
whichever country you come from in the EU, uh, where national governments have a single portal for information or from the Open Data Directive or the Digitalization of Justice. Um, maybe one uh, right now that's being um, negotiated, which is the regulation on digital identity, is a very interesting one as well. Um, I can urge you to take a look at this because this is, for example, taking really uh, the interpretable characteristic of this future digital identity in account. And there, um, so far, we don't yet have the final text, so I, I won't go too further in it, but so far, member states will have to issue uh, a European digital identity wallet uh, with common standards to make sure that all EU members will recognize it um, between countries. And there, with this simple example, I think you can understand a bit more of the importance of it, because it also means that since digitalization now is so advanced already, but still has a lot still has many ways to go. Um, it is even more important to make sure that we don't digitalize on our own, in our own member states, but also for the whole EU citizens. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, the ambitions of the Act is also to complete uh, the Digital Decade 2030 targets. That's uh, 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 the big strategy for the EU, uh, for the Objective 2030. Um, and uh, right now, they're trying also to make sure that there is a human-centric approach to this, also with the protection of data, with making sure that interoperability won't be any problem to citizens, but in, on the contrary, we'll be facilitating the connection between citizens and administrations and make sure that there's a possibility for uh, citizens that move from one member state to another or that just benefit from public services from another uh, country to be able to benefit as well as uh, people that come from this country. Um, this is true for citizens, this is also true for businesses, um, since the trade between member states of the Union is important to facilitate this, there needs to be uh, easier ways for these business businesses to access to these public services. Um, and so, I won't delve into the whole act. Uh, the six chapters, it's uh, uh, a few dozen pages, and so I'll just concentrate on, the, on three of these chapters. Um, but I just want to point out at the four, some of the four of the main elements. So the Act sets up, is setting up, sorry, um, co-owned governance structure. Um, I'll explain a bit more, but the idea behind it is that all member states will have their say, and all member states will have a member uh, representing them in this governance structure to establish the standards, the specifications, the needs for achieving interoperability. It's also another point of this act is a question of uh, recognizing interoperability solutions that can be reused and shared between member states, between public administrations to avoid developing the same solution twice, three times, four times, um, and to make sure that there's a proper assessment of this interoperable character of solutions and to make sure that it's actually practically implementable and it's not just theoretically. Um, and finally, it's uh, also through support to uh, the development of these solutions and to public administration that will need to develop these solutions, as well as the implication of public-private actors to do this. Um, and so, one of the first and most important, I believe, uh, part of this legislation, here again, this is a proposals text, so this might not be the final text that will be adopted, and that's also where your point of view is interesting, uh, because as we're still going through the democratic process of negotiations and um, identification of what needs to be negotiated, what will be voted on, um, this is yet not fixed. Um, but yeah, this is the share and reuse mechanism of the Act, which basically will ask any public sector body institutions, which is from the member states or from the European institutions, to make available their solutions, their interoperability solution, if there's another entity uh, such as them that request it. That means if I'm um, the public administration of Berlin, if I'm the city of Berlin and I want to try and reuse a solution developed by the city of Paris for parking tickets, I can ask them and potentially, uh, if it's fulfilling the conditions to be shared uh, by, uh, in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property and so on, then it can be shared and reused and therefore avoid the creation of this solution again and again between member states. 
Um, as you can see, the content needs to include the technical docu documentation, and where applicable, the documented source code. That means also op for open source solutions, basically. Um, the where applicable here is important as well. Um, this won't be possible for every solution, and that's also where the question of which solution can be made interoperable and how to develop this will be important. Um, so far, the, the, the technical specifications won't be sorted out in this law as such. They will be sorted out by the governance structure that will be set up in the Act. Um, there's also, in this Act, the creation of a portal, the interoperable Europe portal, uh, which will act as a single point of entry for knowledge, but also for the solution that are to be published. The share and use mechanism that I just presented is completed by this, uh, because any public sector administration that publishes a solution they developed, uh, that's made interoperable, can just publish it on this portal for other public administrations to see and to reuse. Uh, and therefore, they won't have to be asked by someone else to do so. So they can also do it on a voluntary basis. Um, the very interesting part here is also that this portal is to be connected with other portals with similar functions. So each and uh, all member states of the EU have developed more or less similar portal to this, but the objective is to make them, to, to federate them so that you can have access to all of them and to make sure that we don't again reinvent the wheel twice, three times. Um, and here, um, there's one point that I wanted to point out at. Uh, there's a definition of what an open source license is, which is one of the first time that the European institution defined this. Um, this is, so yeah, um, this is uh, not necessarily the one uh, accepted by, um, or um, the one uh, defin defined by uh, other organization, but this one is sticking also to the EUPL. And this is also pointing out to the fact that this license needs to be able, that this license needs to allow for public administration to share it with other public administration. That's where the primary objective of this definition is. Um, and so now about the governance structure. Um, this might be a bit complex, so keep with me here. Uh, but it's fairly simple if I try to explain it the best I can. So there's first the interoperable your board. The board is composed from one representant of each uh, member state national authority uh, that will take on the role of interoperability or uh, managing interoperability, as well as a member of the Committee of Regions and the European, and, uh, Economic, uh, European Economic and Social Committee, uh, which are two um, advisory institutions from the EU. Um, as well as it, um, and the chair, sorry, of this board will be the European Commission. The board will have most of the prerogatives in terms of governance, in terms of uh, finding the solutions that are uh, to be labeled as interoperable Europe solutions, as well as facilitating the uh, updates on the European interoperability framework and so on. But the board is not alone, it is heavily relying on the advice and the support of the community. Um, the community will be open to any public or private actor that is related to the work on, um, on interoperability solutions for public administration. That means anyone that will help develop this or anyone that's involved in researching it or implementing it in the administrations can be part of that community. So to help the board to take the good decision, but also advise and uh, help in terms of the global structuring of the technical specifications that will be set up afterwards. Um, and each member state will therefore have their national competent authorities. This act uh, asks each member state to designate one, as well as an interoperability coordinators. Um, all these roles are supposed to make sure that each member state is represented there and that they all have a possibility to actually make sure that their say is also heard and that, they're not, um, that there's no member state that will prime on each other's. Um, and now for the fun graph. Uh, here you can see a bit more of what exactly that means, uh, what I was trying to explain. So as you can see, the board will be in charge of adapting the Interoperable Europe agenda. Uh, the agenda is, a f is setting up the priorities for founding and developing new Interoperable Europe solutions. Um, and therefore, for this, they will be consulted 
They will consult the community as well to know more about what priorities should be put on. Uh, they will also adopt guidelines for the interoperability assessments, which will make sure that when developing new solutions, public administrations can do it properly and to follow certain technical specifications so that it is actually implementable. Uh, and uh, as well, they will propose support measures to uh, public administration and or to public private actors developing these solutions. Um, there, the community will also be able to participate in peer reviews um, to help and make sure that other administrations developing these solutions can benefit from the knowledge and the experience from other administrations that have already gone that way. So the, the real purpose here is to make sure that no knowledge is lost because what we see right now is that public administration keep trying to um, reinvent a new solution that's already been done in other states. And while they all face different contexts, they all face common challenges that need to be taken on together. Um, and finally, there's a portal that I was presenting just before where the board can propose solutions to put there as well as a community. The community will be able to propose to put certain solutions that are already existing or that are being developed to be on the, on the portal so that they can be recognized among all public administration in the EU as a potential tool for whatever services they need. Um, so I should still just say that this is quite simplified. Uh, the relationship uh, between the two are a bit more complex than that so far. Uh, but this sums up quite well uh, what the different tax will be. And yeah, other than that, the board also informs and coordinates the community, um, but, uh, and the, the community will bring expertise uh, to the board as such. Um, I'll, take you, I'll, I'll leave you to take a one last good look at it, because after that, you, you won't see it. Uh, if you want to take a picture, it's now or never. But yeah, so... The act itself is trying to change many things. It's mainly trying to bring some coherence in the development of interoperability of public services. Um, it's to have a collaborative approach to it. It's trying to evolve all actors, both member state, national authorities, public administration at local, regional levels, but also the GovTech actors, so the private public uh, actors and developers uh, that works on these solutions because they also know how to do these things. Um, and it's trying to basically also make public administration collaborate better and to make sure that there are more solutions available for reuse um, and to make sure that, yes, uh, there's actually possibility to take advantage of the work done by others uh, and to not waste public money again uh, on developing yet again another solution, yet again another solution. Um, so, yeah, that's mostly it. Um, I hope you didn't get bored by my pronunciation of the word interoperable. I've worked on it very, very strongly. Um, if you have any questions and if you comment, I'll be happy to hear them. Uh, and uh, yeah, please. Thanks a lot, Axel. And um, for me personally, that's really exciting to hear. I mean, I've seen this uh, happen in uh, the Dutch municipalities. You know, everybody. Uh, and uh, reinventing the wheel themselves and mm -hmm. uh, it's about time uh, something like this happens. I'm really wondering where the, the community comes in. Is there anything that you can say about that? Because I don't really see it in the graphs. Yes. Uh, so, um, while it is not still fixed and I, I will put yet again... Uh, it's still a proposal. Uh, uh, yeah, it's still a proposal. It's still not fully described technically where it will go, but uh, the community has an advisory role. That's the main part. But it is also a force of proposition in this act. It is supposed to be uh, able to have possibility to propose their solutions, to propose certain also requirements or technical specifications to enable this. So that's also where I think the open source community has an important role to play because you have the experience. You have developed solutions that are interoperable. So there's a real possibility there to uh, reuse that knowledge and make sure that uh, administrations know that it's possible to do so and that there's different alternatives to create software and public services and digitalization of public services. Very cool. So, questions, yeah? I think there's... Uh, we can fill some time with questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many questions, but I'm trying to try limit <laughs> to like, the top. The only one, The only one, okay. <sighs> <laughs> I can answer the rest of the question yes, just after we'll, if you want. So, okay, so, okay, I, I picked one. Um, so, like, I guess, like, something about interoperability, like, also learning from the experience of, like, working with open source communities, like, usually what you want is you want to have, 
lots of different implementations so you can test and see like if they're actually working together because if you're working on interoperable standard and there's only one implementation, mm -hmm. like it's not really interoperable. So, but I can see that how, for example, like in usually like in European and, and law, like procurement, government procurement is very focused on sort of like competition, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a bit antithetical sometimes to mm -hmm. like interoperability and open source values, or maybe not antithetical, but has tensions with that. So how does the, does the framework and the law address that or does it? Um, okay, if I understand it right, I, I want to make sure I understood that. So, how does the framework address uh, the, this ambivalence between uh, basically uh, the interoperable uh, um, criteria, but also the competition of that? Yeah, like, does it harmonize the goals? Um, I would say this is mainly uh, directed at public administration, and uh, again, the, just as a precision, but the European Union doesn't uh, address public procurement. That is a uh, prerogative of member states, therefore they won't have uh, power over this. Um, this is merely uh, make, trying to make sure that technical specification that will be developed can be done in a certain way. It doesn't necessarily hamper competition because if everyone knows what they need to do, they can still be competitive as long as the rules are transparent and explain to uh, software developers or to whichever person that creates a product, uh, they can, I guess, still have competition. Um, this framework is merely trying to harmonize the way public administrations will uh, manage to develop these solutions. I hope that answered your questions. Okay. You. you can ask more if you want later. I can try to explain that a bit better if you want. Uh, another question here, yes. and then after that we've got one final online okay. question. Then we're done for time. Thank you, Axel. Uh, it's really a step in the right direction that uh, they have to make the solutions available if another in institution mm -hmm. uh, requests it. Wouldn't it be even better if no one had to request it and they just made them available from the get-go? Uh, so the regulation itself uh, does give that possibility. The portal is, so the share and reuse mechanism obligation of when another entity requests it, that's the obligation as such. But the portal itself doesn't need to, no one is, um, you can still publish without being obligated to do it. And that's what I, uh, I maybe didn't explain it so right then, but the obligation of sharing and reuse uh, from another administration doesn't exist if the, if the solution is already published on the portal. So that's also an incentivizing uh, the, to public administration to already publish the solutions because we know like Ozor works on solutions for public administrations. We have great examples of solutions that are being already made interoperable cross-border and these ones could already be on the portal without anyone asking. Okay, cool. So, um, one final online question. You have another one then. Yeah. As you wish. It's either or. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, you do that. Okay. So, uh, in this draft, open source is mentioned in Article 8 first, mm -hmm. where it talks about proposals of open source alternatives. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't open source be mentioned already in Article 4, where it discusses about distribution? So that's not for me to say as such. Yeah. Uh, here I'm representing only the observatory. Uh, I would say this is for uh, policymakers to, uh, to say and maybe also for the open source community to voice up if that's what you think. Um, because as such, the text so far has not been negotiated in Parliament. Uh, right now it's in the ITRE committee, so the industry committee, and it will be negotiated in committee there. Uh, what uh, could be in is still to be discussed. Uh, but it could be interesting though I believe the commission proposal was also based on the fact that while open source is preferable in certain cases, it was not always possible, if I understood that right. Cool, thank you very much. I, I'd love to see this uh, come to uh, fruition, so to speak. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>